Hi, I'm Aaron and this is Exploring Elixir. In this episode, we're going to be looking at property-based testing and we're going to be using the same module that we used in the last episode where we found a bug using just IAX on its own. Now we're going to start adding some unit tests to this module to see if we can tease out some additional issues with it. So on the right here, I've started a small test suite and the first thing I've tested for is that an empty list returns an empty list if you pass it into step count four. And if you look at the code, it's, it's obvious that's going to pass. And this is actually, I think, one of the weaknesses of traditional unit testing frameworks is they encourage and, and result in the creation of a lot of very kind of obvious um, tests that don't really tell us much more about the code than we already know. It's good for catching future errors, but not so much for the immediate here and now and, and teasing out errors as we go. Um, now, the second test I've written here is saying that, well, if we pass in one to step count for, well, it's going to get back a tuple of one, zero. And if we look again at the code, obviously this is going to work because here, step count for, if it takes an integer, returns that tuple. Um, and in fact, if we do run this test as it is, it passes just fine, right? So everything is good and our tests are working, right? Well, actually this second test has a subtle flaw. And we're going to see what this is, see if we can find it um, by writing a property test. So what is a property test? Well, property-based testing says that instead of encoding our expectations, so if we put in this input or actualize the system in this way, this is what we expect to come out, and we encode both sides of that, um, instead it, it encourages us to build a model of what we're testing and then write a test or a set of tests that exercise that model. And so we're going to be using Quixer to write property-based tests here. And I picked Quixer for this for two reasons. One, it's written entirely in Elixir, which is very nice. And second of all, it integrates very nicely with the built-in XUnit framework. So that's a very nice feature. And, and what the property test framework does, it's going to generate dozens, hundreds, or in our case, thousands of test cases that will exercise the model that we build. So it's going to auto-generate tests, which is fantastic because it means that as a developer, we don't have to think about edge cases, common edge cases, that is, um, and we can test even very large input spaces such as uh, the Colat's conjecture has, which is all positive integers. So here's a, a simple model of what the Colat's module could be. We say that if we pass a value into step count for, we're going to get back a list. Um, that's what the spec says here. Step count for takes the values out of the list integer, returns a list. Okay. Uh, that list is going to be in order from smallest to largest. It's going to contain two tuples, and those tuples are going to contain the input number we gave it and the number of steps, which is the result. And the number of steps should be zero for one, which you're testing here, and should be greater than zero for any other positive integer. So we can already see where this test is wrong. In the first item in our, in our model, if we actually wrote it down, would say, well, we expect a list to come out, and that's not what's happening here. So if we write a property test here, we'll see that this gets exposed really quickly. And the way we start a property test is just by saying p test for property test. Um, and the first thing we want to do is model the kind of input that we expect or the kind of data that we want to test with. We're not going to tell it exactly what data, we're going to model it. So let's create a, a variable called input here. And we're actually going to want it to create either lists of integers or integers. So what we're going to tell is we're going to tell it to choose from the following two generators. One is a list which will contain um, integers with a minimum value of two. And we want the minimum size of the list to be one. We don't want to test empty lists. We're already testing that above, so we don't need to continue to do that. Um, or it could return an integer. And again, minimum of two. Um, great. And then we can also tell it how many times we want um, or how many tests we want it to generate. And so let's do that for, for fun here. Let's say let's do, I don't know, 10,000 tests. Great. So now I've told it how to generate the data. And of course, we can name it whatever we want. It doesn't have to be input. It could be X. It could be fuzzy bunny, whatever. And there could be multiple. We could have three, four, ten inputs, but we only need one here. So we create a do and end block. And in here, every time this gets run now, we're going to have this input variable bound for us. So let's try and get some results using that input. And the first thing that we can test for is that it's a list, right? That's the first thing in our model. And if we just stop there for a moment and run this, 
we'll quickly see that we get an error. And it says, yeah, I expected something truthy. It said it got false when input equals two. Um, and the assertion that fails is is list results. And if we look back at our code, we go, oh, right, input two, that's going to call here. And if we couldn't see that easily, we could always run this ourselves in, in say, IAX. Um, and, and of course, it's returning a tuple, not a list. So we don't have to rely on our um, assumptions here as we did up above um, when we we're running this simple test it'll catch these things for us because we take a more model-based approach, a more declarative approach. I think that's really a great deal of the power of property testing. So now we've got that passing. Um, and now let's test the rest of our model. Now we could create different p-tests um, in here, but I'm just for the sake of, of the video here, I'm going to just put it all in one property test. So first of all, let's make sure that um, the results come back well ordered. And I'm going to use enum reduce to do it in this case. I will pattern match on the inputs. We don't need the, the answer. Um, our accumulator will be the last value. And then we're just going to assert that the last value is less than the current input. Um, and then we're going to pass back the current input as the next value to, to uh, try. Then we close it off with an end. Um, great. And so then let's check to make sure that our results are always correct. We don't care about the input. We're just going to grab the answer. And we're going to assert that the um, answer is always greater than zero. Oh, answer bar. There we go. And we're complete there. And so now we're, we're again testing our model. Basically, what we've written up here is just reflected down here, and we're letting the property test framework actually generate the input, the data that we're going to be using a test with. And so it can test quite a bit of the input space. In fact, 10,000 uh, different inputs every time we run this test. So let's try that and see how it goes. And again, we find a problem right away. Now, this one's a little bit harder to suss out because it's giving us this list that is generated full of values. And one of these values is obviously tripping it up because we're getting zero as an answer. And it should always take at least one step to get to one if the value is greater than one. And, and indeed, it is. And so this would tell us, you know, some we have some problems here. And how do we get to the bottom of it? Well, if it's possible, the Quixer framework will actually try and reduce the input or the data that's causing the problem down to a base state, but it, it can't do that with, with this list so well. Um, so it's just giving us the whole list back. So it doesn't really help us. Now we could do a couple things. We could say, well, we might be like an individual integer that's causing the problem. So we could say, let's just get rid of the, um, the list here for now and let's rerun that test. And again, it fails and this time with input of 16. Okay, that's interesting. We could run it again. 256, run it again, no failures. Now remember, it's doing random generated uh, inputs, 10,000 of them, so we're not always gonna get a failure. Again, and so now we start to see a pattern, 16, 256, 512, these are all powers of two, or multiples of, of, of two. Um, so that gives us a, a good hint. When we look at our is even here, um, oh, there it is, step count plus zero. So if it's even and it's a perfect multiple of two, we're going to keep dividing by two. It's going to keep coming into this function. And of course, step count is never going to get incremented. Um, in fact, when I originally wrote this, I had that exact typo and I found it with uh, such a property test. Okay, so we fixed that test. Now we want to make sure that always it's providing that, um, that uh, value or a value that we could test with. Um, so what we can do is we can say that our integers must have, and we can include multiple values. So we can say, you know, um, 256 and 512. Those are two values that we knew uh, caused problems last time. So hopefully we fixed the problem. Let's try that again. And indeed, it works nicely. And so now if we reintroduce that, that bug, it will immediately catch us. This is kind of like traditional unit testing that we can encode um, or capture the knowledge that we, we have about what has been problematic in the past or that we're worried about for future while still retaining that randomness. Now, if we had said just integer here, it would have also automatically in every run put in negative one, zero, and one. Um, if we had not said that there was a minimum value of one 
uh, or, or list must have at least one entry with this min one here, um, it would have always tested with an empty list. So it also generates uh, the common edge conditions for the data type, which is really useful. It means we don't have to remember to do that as developers. Uh, and pretty much any Elixir data type that you can imagine can be used in here as a generator. And you can have as many generators as you want or just one um, as well. So this is a really powerful way of building uh, tests that really exercise our code in very powerful ways. Now, I mentioned that this is not the only option. Quixer is one of uh, a few really good um, test suites. There are other ones that are built on top of the trick and proper testing or, or, or proper uh, test suites, and both of which are written in Erlang. Um, I'll link to those projects in the description below. I'll also provide a link to a really great website uh, that captured one person's uh, exploration of property-based testing um, at propertesting.com. If you're really interested in property-based testing and how to take advantage of it, I really recommend reading through it. It's written from the airline perspective, but everything that's in there is completely uh, applicable to Elixir as well. So I hope you found this interesting. Um, I hope you give property-based testing a try in your next project if you haven't already done so. And I'll see you in the next episode.